uh, first, thank you, Tom Solomon, for the invitation. And as you said, I'm sharing this presentation with Dr. Demopito Miranda, who is the coordinator of the Murg Pediatric Court. He has kindly agreed to participate in this panel. So please address all the difficult questions to him at the end, if you may. So what I can show you is that what you saw before, that uh, in Pernambuco State, Brazil, there were dengue, chikungunya virus, and Zika, they were circulating. Zika virus had just been introduced in the country, and we had no system, official register system for it. So we used to call it dengue-like disease. So you can see here, I mean, the amount, there was an outbreak of dengue-like disease, shall follow it shortly by the lumbar head syndrome, and six months after, a huge outbreak of microcephaly, neonates with microcephaly. So the orange line that was clustered in space and time. So the evidence of Zika viral infection related to GBS patients regionally was the first hint, the first sign of that Dr. Carlos Brito used, I mean, to raise the hypothesis of a possible brain damage associated with Zika exposure during pregnancy. We must remember that at that time, there were no report association between Zika virus infection during pregnancy and birth defect, not even the outbreaks, the previous outbreak in French Polynesia. Actually, Zika virus was considered to cause a mild disease and not was really considered a public health threat. So we had a public health problem. Large numbers of newborns with severe microcephaly of a known cause, space and time cluster that became a national health, international and national, let's say, concern emer emergency. And Zika plan is all about this effort to understand this new disease that's congenital Zika syndrome. So as far as I can remember, this was the special section of Zika in the first journal that published a special section for Zika. And there were two papers I would like to highlight. One was the editorial entitled Zika, the Tragedy and the Opportunities by Dr. Laura Rodriguez from London School that has been part of MERG Task Force since the beginning, 2015. And Dr. Rodriguez just wrote about this unprecedented public health situation, what she called the first possible first congenital transmission of a vector-borne virus in human, and possibly the first sexual transmission of vector-borne uh, vector virus. So the second paper by Dr. Democritus showed that microcephaly together what I would say major congenital birth defects. Here's a picture of a newborn uh, baby in the ICU with arthrogryposis of leg and arm. So this was a spectrum of severity of the disease. But what I find most interesting in his paper is that the table where he placed Zika with the torsion infections. So here for the first time for us epidemiologists, there was a striking difference mode of transmission for the first time within the congenital transmissions, we had an arthropod and sexual virus transmission. And this was really considered dangerous and a threat, not only for Americas, but also for other parts of the world or for the world as a whole. Okay. So what I can say, other important, let's say, first papers in the beginning of 2016 is a large number of infants born with microcephaly. 
And here, I would like just to call the attention that this uh, new board had kind of a distinct physical appearance. It was really not a new phenotype, but it was a rare event before the outbreak of Zika congenital infection. And this appearance is a result of a substantial loss of the brain volume and contractures, hypertonia, irritability were noticed since the early stage in the newborns. So I wouldn't dare describe here or to get into details of CT for many of the neurologists who are here attending, I think, this panel. But I would remember and see all the papers about it, saying about thin cerebral cortex, cortex with subcortical calcification, and the words ventriculomegaly, lesencephaly being placed and being written in almost all of the papers talking about CT in newborns and later on. So I want to just to show the attention that the first case control study done by our group looked at possible risk factors for the increase in congenital microcephaly cases that were observed in Pernambuco between 2015 and 2016. Okay, we, we have to remember that at the beginning of the epidemic, uh, many other hypotheses besides Zika infections were raised like vaccine use, larvae size use, and drugs during pregnancy. So we had to screen newborns from eight hospitals. We recruit 91 newborns with microcephaly and method by controls with microcephaly. And we tested for Zika uh, serology, uh, CSF, for, for the babies with microcephaly and not for their controls, of course. And we just came out with a striking difference between the amount of babies with evidence of Zika infections between two groups. But more important, I think, that the striking, uh, say, very high odds ratio, that was be very strong odds ratio, that in the study, we could show, we could not found evidence of association of other risk factors. That was very important at the time, because at that time there was a big issue about if the rubella vaccine was causing this kind of microcephaly, or even if larvae sites were the cause of this uh, outbreak. So uh, as far as I remember, this was uh, one of first slides that was a democratic slides considering that well, if you have microcephaly, maybe microcephaly is only the tip of the iceberg. Because we have such a large structural brain damages, it would be expected early epilepsy, visual impairment, uh, impairment of neurodevelopment, a dysphagia, and all of the things were found and described during the time that we had the Zika plan support. Hearing, hearing impairment just was something that was thought to be important because it was kind of a thinking about similarity with cytomegalovirus, but came out not to be such important or a, not, I mean, very common among the microcephalic cases and other anomalies. We would say here, we didn't put the visual impairment is something private and it was very important saying like there were anomalies of the anterior and posterior eye and microcephaly, coloboma, optical, let's say, hypoplasia, macular scanning and so on. And there were uh, many papers written by our colleagues, Dr. Ventura, that uh, were very, important and partner during this. So 
if we see all this spectrum, what we could expect that we would need the multidisciplinary ex exports, like say, like pediatric in full infectious disease, developmental pediatrics, neurology, ophthalmology, odology, speech therapies, and you name it, urologists and so on. So uh, you might expect that not all these expertise, I mean, are available, especially in, uh, let's say, in middle income countries and probably not available for the population, the vulnerable population. So I would think that there was a big effort to join all this research to make what we call in Portuguese multinome, is joint effort, one day of follow-up, well organized, with developed protocols where we could include many of the specialists to follow up the children in a very specific date. So for this part of the work, for the court and the follow-up of this clinical court, I would say that was the Zika plan support was really very, very important. I mean, I think that most of this effort couldn't be done without the support, not only financial support, but also the, uh, the network that was built during the Zika plan network. So if we go here, I want just to say, what are the sources of this pediatric course that have been, been assisted and evaluated and follow up but by this thing. So we have here from the early beginning of the epidemic, about 195 children that were born during the outbreaks. So they were seen from the, uh, let's say for, for the clinics. We had 80 children from the case control studies where it had been really evaluated at birth and had all the prenatal exams done. And now we had, we could count what, with children that were born from pregnant women court that were retrieved from the surveillance system from Pernambuco State. So this is very interesting because we were having to, a possibility to follow the pairs of mother and children from, from a large group of individuals. And then, very importantly, there was a CIP study protocol where the studies the control groups, the, the neonates from this group of pregnant women are taking, let's say, as a population control. As you know, epidemiologists always think about designs, but we always think in the designs to have a control group where we can compare all the adverse outcomes. So for all this preparation here to develop a comprehensive clinical laboratory imaging assessment and put it into place, I must here, I have to acknowledge the efforts and persistence of Dr. Democrito Miranda, who is the coordinator of the uh, children's court studies and also Dr. Ricardo Chimenez, who is the um, coordinator of the pregnant woman protocols. So here, I want to say, this was the last meeting of the mothers in Recife. So you can say um, like the motor deficit of children born with congenital microcephaly. Now, um, I was supposed to say about the legacy of it. So thinking about the legacy, I would say that one of the challenges and the legacy, I think, is the possibility to deliver healthcare attendance integrated with the research activities. And for this, I would like to thank the Zika plan. And the other one was to strengthen research capacity. And here I have to, say that this one day attendance like this Muchiroins would only be possible if we could integrate postgraduate students and 
experts together. So they make this effort to assist the children within a protocol or developing a protocol, a systematic protocol. And I would like to emphasize also as a legacy, the longer lasting partnerships with policymakers, I would say locally, regional, national and international. And it has been really a pleasure to be part of this large international Zika plan network. Before I just end, I would like to acknowledge the institution and the contributors from Brazilian institutions, from Secretary of Health, from Fundação Altino Ventura, London School, and our postgraduate programs. And now to say thank you very much. First to Annelise, that's the coordinator of the program, that's her profile in the Lancet. And I agree entirely what said in her profile published in Lancet about her energy and what she drives people to work together. So applause to Adelise and also to our dearest friend, Dr. Laura Holik Grigli and Elizabeth Whitley, who are really our uh, persons that we admire for their integrity, ethical, and hardworking our group. Thank you very much for your attention and be here for questions if there are any. Thanks very much, Selena. Um, that's fantastic. Uh, please post questions or comments in, in English or Portuguese or Spanish. And um, uh, we've got one come in from on the chat function. Um, so recently there have been reports of potential interactions with between Pyripoxifen, which I think is an insecticide, and Zika virus in CNS developmental anomalies in animal models. Of course, there was a big issue about, you know, whether this was all due to insecticide usage. But the question is, could the use of Pyripoxifen in Recife explain the high impact of congenital Zika syndrome there compared to other areas of Brazil and Latin America? You know, have we finally answered this question about why Recife is different to everywhere else? And is it insecticides in addition to the virus? Well, uh, first, uh, may I answer this question? Is Democrito here? Democrito is there, yeah. So maybe if Democrito okay. wants but, but to- but uh, May I answer this now. question? Well, I, I can easily answer this question. Uh, Recife yep. is not different from other parts of Brazil. If we take uh, the prevalence of microcephaly, they're almost the same. I mean, they were very high and almost the same in most of the states of Brazil in 2016. So uh, Recife is not an exception. Okay. And about Piriproxifen, there is a publication that was uh, the first author is Dr. Maria de Fatima Militão, with ecologically first Piriproxifen was not a larvicide used in the municipality of Recife. Okay. It was use in other municipalities. So we have here not an environmental problem because uh, this insecticide was, was, I mean, not used specific in this area. Um, and what we can say is that even if it's an animal model, there is no evidence in other sites. And it couldn't explain why we had so many cases of microcephaly in places there was no use of this larger site, such as Colombia, uh, travelers, and so on. So I think larger site was a very easy to rule out for us at the beginning because there was no uh, an ecological, let's say, uh, correspondence between the areas where they use uh, larger sites and the areas where there were this increase of prevalence of microcephaly. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, Democrito is sharing uh, the screen there to uh, help draw attention to that. Um, I guess one other question is whether you feel now, so clearly you made the point, uh, I thought you articulated it very well that, you know, the, uh, the microcephaly um, drew attention to the problem. And since then, we've found lots of other congenital Zika syndromes. Um, I mean, we're now several years out uh, but do you still feel that we are 
um, identifying problems in children who up till now were thought to be completely normal, but it's only now that they're getting into school um, that it's becoming apparent maybe that they, they, their cognitive functions are not as good as they would otherwise have been. Um, or maybe if I could put that another way, you could imagine that um, something like this virus, it, it could cause just to say a 10% shift in, in uh, IQ of the whole population. And of course, you wouldn't know that every individual child, you would just think they're fine. You know, they have a particular in IQ, a particular intelligence level. But is there is there the possibility that you would see changes that you could only detect by looking at population averages that you might miss if you just looked at individual children? Let's see if I can start answering, then Democrito can complement if he wants. Uh, actually, where we have the screening tests, like uh, say a sweet, I mean, the screening tests for, or like say, multi-dimensional, like a motor, skill language, and things like this, they're very different. And very the children with microcephaly score very badly. I mean, you can even imagine by the brain damage. But yeah. the other children that were born in the same period, they screen it okay. And even with the bail symptoms, they simply to, to screen okay. So um, actually discussing before this presentation, we had the feeling that most of the spectrum is under the microcephaly and severe and moderate microcephaly. And the iceberg below, I mean, the ones who weren't damaged, had structural brain damage, doesn't look like they have different scores in the bales and things like this. So this is interesting up to now. So but we need to have to follow more children. And that's why we're so, I mean, it's so important to have a prolonged follow-up and to have this population children from negative mothers from the same region so you, you can compare in long terms, in long terms. But it looks okay. like all the spectrum is concentrated in that uh, in that tip of the iceberg okay democrito do you have anything to add is there anything that, that we need to add that yeah, we have covered uh, yet before? yeah thank you uh, it's about the, the the first part of your question uh, is uh, a, a few comments about the the syndrome uh, 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 what we are just thinking now is that maybe we can put in the in the name, in the, in the nomination of syndrome, congenital Zika syndrome is that very typical cases with microcephaly and a, a lot of other complications and abnormalities that configure really a syndrome. And uh, we can observe uh, just uh, based on the larger studies with cohort studies from mothers that who were uh, with Zika during pregnancy, we can see also uh, a, a few number of, of, of children with uh, isolated or combinating two or three manifestations, but not configuring uh, exactly a syndrome. So children, what we can say is that children without microcephaly can, we can, I don't know, name uh, them as Congenital Zika with isolated or combined uh, symptoms is a, con a congenital disease, but not a, like a syndromic. And uh, we can observe that uh, is, there is another, uh, that also a spectrum of uh, manifestations uh, in, in children with microcephaly. Baby, even children with microcephaly, there is a, a, a spectrum also. Uh, uh, since microcephaly without, without all of these conjunct of, of, of manifestations mm -hmm. or yeah. syndrome, uh, syndromic babies with microcephaly and all these, these manifestations mm -hmm. and radiologic findings, etc. cetera. Okay. Well, thank you. Thanks to both of you for, um, you know, what's really been a, a really important area of the overall Zika plan project. And we're now going to move on to Julia, who's going to give us some uh, perspectives on some of these neuroinfectious problems from animal models. Julia Edgar from 
University of Glasgow, uh, who's sharing her screen as well, I think. Yes. So, Thank you very much. Tom, can you right. hear me? We can hear you. We can see your slides. We can't yet see you. Yeah, um, I just realised that I didn't switch my camera on. And once I start sharing slides, I'm not sure how easy that is to do. Can I uh, oh, start my video? You could just oh, stop. Oh, your share. There you are. Yeah, we've got you. Brilliant. I was trying Thanks. to be smart by sharing my uh, slides in advance. OK, so thank you. And it's very nice to be here um, today talking to you about understanding neuroinfectious diseases using animal models. So what we have done in Glasgow and with collaborators elsewhere is that we have modeled nervous system infection in vitro, in cell cultures and also in vivo. And we've mainly modeled uh, the fetal infection and try to understand the uh, tropism and pathogenesis of Zika virus infection. Just as a brief reminder, if my slides will move on. Neurogenesis happens early in embryonic development. So in humans, neurogenesis occurs largely during the first trimester. Soon after, yolk site derived myeloid cells enter the central nervous system and become the microglial cells, the brain's immune cells. And I've shown a representation of a microglial cell here. So these come from the embryonic yolk sac. They enter the brain relatively early on in neurodevelopment. And as I say, these are the main immune cells of the central nervous system. They're present in the parenchyma of the, of the brain and spinal cord. Gliogenesis and myelination happen somewhat later. So in human development, uh, myelination and gliogenesis, formation of astrocytes and oligodendrocytes and the formation of myelin sheaths around axons begins later. So it begins in the second trimester. Most myelination really happens uh, postnatally in, during year one and two postnatally. So we've used, as I mentioned, cell cultures and in vivo models to mimic this here, different stages of development, early development and later uh, development and indeed adulthood. As Hugh mentioned to you earlier, we looked also at direct infection in the peripheral nervous system, but since we found little evidence of direct infection of Zika virus in our peripheral nervous system myelinating cell cultures, I'm not going to talk to you much about that. The focus today will be on the central nervous system. So we began our studies using a myelinating cell culture system to model a perinatal infection in the first instance, so uh, infection of infants just before term. And later in a very recent publication from Verena Schultz et al, postnatal infection. We're very proud of this myelinating cell culture system that was developed here in Glasgow by a veterinary neurologist called Christine Thompson, because it has hugely reduced the number of animals that we use uh, for the types of studies involving infection by viruses and other pathogens. It doesn't stop our, us using animals, but it informs the animal studies and hence reduces the number of animals that we use for these studies. So as I said to you, we infected these myelinating cell cultures with Zika virus, and we found that those infected both uh, in terms of perinatal of the, or the, the cultures mimic, mimicking the perinatal period and those mimicking postnatal period, we found in all cases that the cells that were most susceptible to infection were glial cells, and particularly oligodendrocytes. So oligodendrocyte precursor cells shown here, astrocytes shown here, and mature oligodendrocytes shown here were, were all susceptible to infection. But the one that was most vulnerable to injury was the myelinating oligodendrocyte, the one shown on the top right here. And these uh, red dots, if you like, or these puncta represent degrading myelin sheath. So our conclusion from this was that post neurogenesis neurons are relatively refractory to infection. We found very few neurons infected with Zika virus. Glial cells are susceptible and the oligodendrocyte in particular is susceptible to, is, is vulnerable to injury. And just to remind you, we saw very little evidence of direct infection in the peripheral nervous system. 
So soon after that, or around 2020, last year, studies were published demonstrating that uh, children, congenitally infected children who were born completely asymptomatic, went on to show neurodevelopmental abnormalities. And in some cases, so there are a number of these uh, studies here, I hope I'm not contradicting anything Selena, Selena just told you. Uh, there are a number of these studies and the picture I've shown here is from Pimentel et al 2021. And what they show is that these children manifest sometimes transient neurodevelopmental delays, sometimes more long-term neurodevelopmental neuro delays. So knowing what we knew from our in vitro studies, that led us to ask whether these neurodevelopmental delays in otherwise asymptomatic children, so children who were asymptomatic at birth, might be due to um, infection or injury of oligodendrocytes and of myelin. So to address this, we did indeed use an animal model this time, the FNR1 knockout mice that are uh, lacking in type 1 interferon receptor. Here is the mock infected animal here. It looks perfectly normal for a, a postnatal day 10 mouse. So we infected these mice around postnatal day 5 which is similar in the mouse in terms of what's happening with myelination to the perinatal period or preterm period in, in children. The Zika infected animals, on the other hand, did manifest neurological uh, symptoms or signs, I should say. So there's a flaccid tail. This animal here has a flaccid tail. The belly rests on the floor here and the hind limbs um, are not upright as they are in the mock infected animal. This animal here fails to be able to right itself. So it's lying on its back. It tries to right itself, but it is unable to do so. So these animals do develop neurological signs around five, na five days after intraperitoneal neal infection. What we found, so similar to what we found in vitro, was that when we looked at the nervous system of these animals, there was evidence for cell death, so cleave caspase three positive cells. This is the postnatal day 10 spinal cord, dorsal or posterior columns in human, ventral or anterior columns in human here, uh, dorsal horn and ventral horn here. So we found evidence for cleaved caspase three positive cells indicating apoptosis around sites where we also observed Zika virus positive cells. And these Zika virus positive cells were predominantly located in the white matter. We found this consistently in both brain and spinal cord. When we looked more closely and used markers of cell type specificity, we found that at least some of these cells, some of these infected and apoptotic cells, expressed a marker of mature oligodendrocytes. To confirm this, we went to electron microscopy. We used electron microscopy. This is a light microscope, Im microscopic image of a one micron thick resin section where you can see pycnotic nuclei, small condensed dark nuclei in the white matter. So these are myelinated axons here. The dark rings are the myelin and the, the pale structures in the center are the axons. When we looked more closely by electron micros microscopy, we could see evidence of dying cells interspersed with perfectly normal appearing healthy cells. Here's a healthy oligodendrocyte that was found pretty close to these other dying oligodendrocytes. Now I identified them as myelinating oligodendrocytes because you can see they're forming dark rings of myelin around the purple uh, labeled axons here. And the nuclei look completely abnormal. There's swelling of the ER and the Golgi apparatus. So the, these in vivo studies fitted very nicely with what we had already shown in vitro, indicating that in the post neurogenesis period, oligodendrocytes are particularly susceptible to infection and to injury. And that fitted quite nicely with our hypothesis that possibly these neurodevelopmental delays in children who appeared normal at birth could well reflect a, a myelin abnormality.
Now, myelin, developmental myelination, deficits in developmental myelination, I should say, can catch up. So that may help explain some of the fact that some of these neurodevelopmental delays are only transient. The problem that might be encountered later is that it has been shown previously in an animal model whereby the oligodendrocytes were killed genetically, so specific killing of the oligodendrocyte. This is followed subsequently by loss of the myelin sheath and leads months later to an autoimmune type demyelination event. So it really indicates that even in asymptomatic children, who may or may not uh, have a transient myelination deficit, that one should be aware that these children may be susceptible later to autoimmune mediated demyelination. The other thing that I'm going to show you now, I'm going to show two slides from Suzanne Captain, and now she was more interested in what was happening in animal models during the period of neurogenesis. And so what Suzanne and colleagues from the Institute of Pasteur and other places showed very nicely in this very nice uh, publication of Nature Communications came out recently in 20, 2021, that there is higher fetal pathogenicity for African Zika virus strains than Asian isolates or strains in mouse models of microcephaly. So unlike us, Suzanne infected these animals in the early embryonic period. So I think it was embryonic day 10, but Suzanne can correct me if I'm wrong about that. And what they found was that there was a higher path, higher fetal pathogenicity for the African Zika virus strains. The take home message from their study is that the recent African Zika strains display a higher transmissibility in mosquitoes. This is an important observation and higher lethality in both adult and fetal mice than their Asian counterparts. Now, Suzanne and colleagues conclude that this may be the reason why we see neurodevelopmental delays as a consequence of infection by the Asian strains, but not by the African ones because of the high degree of embryonic lethality. So I hope I've convinced you that animal models and animal derived cell cultures have several benefits, not least in terms of their flexibility. So it allows us to look at infections at different time points of development and in adulthood using different transgenic animals in reporter mice, FNR1 knockout mice and so on. So a lot of flexibility in the system. In terms of a lasting legacy, well, our staff and students have received training infection in infection myology that they otherwise would not have. We have developed in vitro models for studying CNS and PNS infection that reduce the number of animals required for these studies by informing the subsequent animal experimentation. We have developed in vivo models and we have made many new collaborations with people around the world. Uh, I want to highlight Susanna Lant because when we wrote up the recent uh, publication there on the in vivo infection, Susanna was extremely helpful in putting us together with other NeuroZika uh, clinicians. So thank you particularly to, to Susanna for that. And a lot of the work was done uh, by Verena Schultz. A lot of the experimental work that I presented to you was done by Verena Schultz and others, of course. So just to thank you for your attention and for the funders, particularly Zika Plan, but also Medical Research uh, Council and the Wellcome Trust. Thank you, Julia. Lovely presentation. Um, wonderful slides. OK, uh, we have a bit of time for questions or comments. Hugh. Yes, it's fantastically interesting that, Julia. Um, do you think there's a case for sort of white matter for, you know, detailed follow-up white matter MRI focused studies in a children's cohort. And can we ask any of our clinical colleagues whether such studies are taking place in a resource capable location? Yeah, can I, can I just answer briefly and then I'll leave it to our clinical colleagues. I, I believe some MRI studies have been done on infants here. White matter can be difficult to image uh, in infants. It can yeah. be difficult to 
to see abnormalities by MRI. I understand this is not my area of expertise because there is so little white matter or so little myelin present in infants. That said, I am aware of some MRI studies where children who, who appeared asymptomatic, clinically asymptomatic, did manifest white matter uh, abnormalities by MRI. But let me ask. One of the things would be to look serially over time, wouldn't it, Tom, in a, in a sort of planned longitudinal cohort? Yes, but I, I mean, I think the changes, you know, uh, MRI are not great at picking up subtle changes on, on routine um, imaging. Um, I don't know if, um, if any of our pediatric or developmental colleagues has a comment, Selena or Democrito, um, but... Uh, I, you know, it's possible, I guess, uh, that you might see changes over time. Um, Selena, what do you think about that? Because, you know, following cohorts of kids longitudinally to see whether they have been, um, you know, affected. I think the idea is that did, did, did infection, presumably, Julia, you're saying young children, so not, not congenital, but young children who got infected, could the virus have infected their myelination in, in a way that we might see over time as they grow up? Yeah, I think, well, there is a subset, subset of children um, uh, that were exposed, prenatally exposed. I think they, they had a pregnant woman exposed to Zika virus and they had no signs of this phenotype typical or no immediately, let's say, and they were submitted to, to a MRI. Um, uh, up to now, they didn't find anything exceptional about it. There was about 30 cases that were done it. Remember that to do an MRI in a child that has no, <laughs> I mean, immediately, let's say medical purpose is something quite uh, not usual, uh, just for research purpose and uh, to, to have an MRI of a child uh, that wouldn't be enough. So, but what I, I think is interesting, Julia, about your exposition, so we have to look at it. But as far as I know, there are several court studies doing Bailey in Brazil, and they have subgroups of children with as controls that were exposed. That had, um, I mean, there were children born from pregnant women that were certainly exposed by Zika. Uh, and these children do not have any different from the control groups that were not exposed. And there were large holes in daily studies and so on. So but I have to, we have to watch and to see the difference between those studies and see if they're mild or not. If we're missing something and we have, to, they have to have prolonged follow-up, that's for sure. And I really appreciate your presentation. It was very nice. I'm going to take a close look at the papers and to see how we can, I mean, figure out this difference, animal models and clinical practice and clinical courts. Thank you. Thank you, Selena. There's a few questions and comments come in, so we'll keep them short so we can keep moving. But uh, Dr. Margarita has said that the follow-up study led by Dr. Mulkey et al. concerning the Colombian cohort does include MRI follow-up at age seven. So that would be very interesting to, to, to look at that. Um, there's a question from, uh, um, Sonia actually was gonna ask a question. I think if she wants to come on. Uh, while she's coming on, I'll very quickly give you the question from Lida, which is how these animal model findings support therapeutic approaches. So, you know, do, do these point to any particular treatments, Julia? Just, just a brief answer, I think. Uh, so that's not really my area. I mean, co cholesterol supplementation, dietary cholesterol supplementation, for example, can help restore myelin. Yeah. Hugh, do you want to add something as a, you know, as a clinician about whether any of these uh, in vitro and mouse studies point to particular treatments or is it a bit early for that, do you think? I think it's too early, Tom, um, really. And, uh, and it may be behavioural modification, schooling, etc., or just awareness of the problem as much as coming in with a specific, you know, intervention right now. Sonia, let's have your question and then we'll move on to the next session. Okay. 
Um, so Selina already showed us that there is a clinical overlap between, you know, different um, microcephaly or congenital syndromes in relation to other pathogens. So I was wondering, for instance, with the torch pathogens, if there's also something known about similarities in the pathogenesis. Oh, no, that's a good question, Sonia. Sonia, sorry. And I'm not able to answer it. I don't know if Hugh is able to to help me out. Here. Oh, yeah, I, I missed part of it. My internet broke up, so you'll have to ask it again. Oh, I was I was wondering if with the torch pathogens and the congenital syndromes, if the, the pathogenical mechanism is similar uh, as has has uh, Julia found now with them. Um, with, with the oligodendrocyte infection? Yeah, for instance, yeah. Yeah. Well, at a superficial level, probably yes, but the devil will be in the detail. I mean, I think Julia hasn't told you about some of the other work that's been done under work package for looking at the sort of intracellular molecular pathways that are mediating some of these events. And, um, and our um, collaborators in Sweden have also wor worked on this. Um, Okay. And so I think it's likely to some extent to be virus specific. Um, I'm going to let Selena's come back on. She can say one sentence and then we'll move on. If she, but I think she may have some thoughts on Torch. I was just going to say that's a very good question. But what I want to point out that the Torch, the other Torch, they're a multi organ kind of, uh, let's say, uh, outcome, such diverse outcomes, you have a liver, spleen. You have a skin lesions and so on. It's very different. When you look at congenital Zika syndrome baby, you look at it's not extreme expectant. He seems all right, <laughs> just with a very small head. And all the bad things start to happen after six months, like dysphagia, um, epilepsy, and so on and so on. So must be very difficult mechanism as far as I can uh, look with my epidemiological hat. Okay. <laughs> See you. Thank you. Thank, thanks for that. Thank you. And it's lovely to have this interaction of the clinical and epidemiology and also the, the basic science. So thank you all very much.